and uh, for anybody that just walked in, Morris's have a new grandbaby. I know. So, so exciting. Granddaughter. Granddaughter. Granddaughter, uh, yes. So Jeff asked me to teach this month. He's teaching the youngsters, and so I'm going to be filling in here. Uh, I will be out next week going to Camp Nikomo, and, and so I think we're having prayer time next week, but I'll, I will be out. Um, so uh, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, come into your presence today and we ask your blessing on our uh, time of study. May you uh, bless the reading and, and studying of your word and uh, give us greater understanding and may it shape our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I am, uh, have wanted to talk about the Gospel of Luke and specifically to present Luke as um, the answer to Isaiah's prophecy of bringing, that one would bring good news to the poor. And I think that is a central, perhaps the central theme of the Gospel of Luke is bringing good news to the poor. So I want to look at the Gospel of Luke over the next few weeks uh, just from that particular perspective and see how that informs the way Luke uh, takes his uh, very specific um, approach to how he presents the Gospel that, that is somewhat different than the other, other Gospels. So I want to start today in Luke chapter 4. And uh, let's start about verse 14. Um, this is the beginning in Luke's Gospel of Jesus' public ministry, uh, starting in verse 14. So the things that have come before this in Luke, and we will go back and look at some of these things, the things that have come before this are... Uh, genealogy, uh, Luke opens, uh, well no, I'm, I'm wrong. The, the things that come before this are the uh, uh, several angelic visitations that, that are bringing good news. Uh, of course, the John the Baptist and the, uh, Luke specifically goes into the birth of John the Baptist and the prophecy about his birth. And uh, then, of course, there's the birth narrative. There is a story about Jesus at the temple that only Luke includes. And uh, as I think all of the Gospels include the baptism of Jesus. So these things have come before this. Uh, there is no, before this point in Luke, there is no calling of disciples. There's no other miracles or preaching this is the opening of the public ministry. Uh, up to this is just the baptism and so forth, but this is the beginning of his public ministry. And, and so keep that in mind. Keep in mind that none of these other things that we might have seen in some of the other Gospels come before this point in Luke. So starting at verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on Him, and He began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, 
heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown, but in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow, and there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Nahum, Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So Luke tells this story, and he brings into this some things like, uh, you have heard, you, you will say to me, the things we heard you did at Capernaum do here in your hometown as well. So in a way, it's an awkward way to open Jesus' public ministry. He's talking about these miracles, but this is the first time. If you're just sitting down and reading Luke from the beginning, you haven't read the other Gospels, you're not already familiar with these stories, you come to that and say... Capernaum, where's Capernaum? I've never, this is the first mention of Capernaum or, or miracles in this book. And so uh, it's, it's an awkward way to start the story because there's no mention of what he did at Capernaum as would have been the case in the other Gospels. And so I think there's a, that Luke is very intentionally putting this at the beginning. And I think it's a mistake to read this as if Jesus comes into a temple and gets the scroll and happens to come to a passage and says, oh yes, this is one of many passages in the Old Testament that refer to me. This is about me. I think this is very specifically, at least in Luke's gospel and in Luke's way of telling the story, this is the uh, passage that says, this is what I'm here for. This is why I've come. I've come to preach good news to the poor. He's reading, of course, Isaiah 61. Actually, there's one line, I think, that's borrowed from another passage in Isaiah here, but primarily from the first few verses of Isaiah 61. And I think Luke is presenting this as the beginning of his public ministry to say, not simply this is one of many passages that talk about Jesus, but rather this is the uh, reason that Jesus is here as far as Luke is concerned. This is what his ministry is about. It is preaching good news to the poor and the rest of the gospel is going to expand on that. So let's, let's go back to Isaiah 61 and, and read that passage from Isaiah uh, a little more closely. Isaiah 61, starting at verse 1, probably read the first uh, three verses or so. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So the first thing that kind of comes to our the, the, the first question that presents itself when I read this passage anyway is the same question that the Ethiopian asked of, um, who was it, Philip, uh, who's, who is Isaiah, in a different, he's referring to a different passage in Isaiah, but he says, who's the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And you could read this and, and, and ask that question, who is this about? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, is Isaiah talking about himself. And, um, of course, we are looking back on it with the authoritative of, 
interpretation from Jesus who says, yeah, this is about me, so we don't really have to debate that question, and yet I think it's entirely plausible to say this is Isaiah talking about himself as well as someone yet to come. I, 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 I guess I don't know that I have to defend that, but it seems at least just reading the passage when you first read it, you would say, why not Isaiah? Certainly Isaiah um, is preaching good news to the poor. Um, but when we see the word anointed, this is by definition a messianic prophecy. And yet, as Jeff has emphasized many times, the, the word Messiah is really a common word in the Old Testament and can be applied to any number of people, even to Cyrus, for example. He's brought that out. And so it's, it's not clear from the passage itself that this is who this anointed one is, other than, again, we have Jesus' authoritative interpretation. Anointed um, is used in the Old Testament um, mostly of kings, and so we, we talk about messianic prophecies, we usually think of them referring to a coming king, and that's appropriate. Here, though, the anointing is is um, associated with bringing good news to the poor. The anointing is referred in the Old Testament to kings mostly, but in the uh, in the law, in the Torah, when you find the word anointed, it's mostly referring to priests. And on a couple of occasions in the Old Testament, we see anointing referring to prophets. I think that anointing can refer to all of these offices, but here specifically, the uh, prophetic ministry, or the prophetic office, I should say, is, is what is associated with anointing. It's, it's bringing good news. So this is the anointing of someone who is going to bring good news to the poor. And associated with this anointing is the Spirit of the Lord God. Um, for, for some reason, this is linked as, as causal. It says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. If you look at how the, especially in the Torah, how, the, how anointing is used. Anointing is intended to make someone or something holy. And by holy, that means fit for God's presence. We see the altar, the, um, the, the uh, tabernacle, all of these things were anointed to make them holy so that God could dwell there. So this would seem to be uh, anointing enables the Spirit of God to dwell with someone uh, by, by putting that, that holiness uh, uh, that's associated with anointing. So Isaiah says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. The reason for the anointing is to bring good news to the poor. Uh, so at, at this point we should ask, who are the poor? That, that the good news is for. And I think it'll be important for us to understand that as we uh, look at what Luke's message is. If, if we think of the poor as being simply those whose taxable income is below the poverty threshold for a family of four, I think we're going to miss a lot of the point here. I don't mean to imply that Luke or Isaiah are not concerned with those who are materially poor, because that will be a part of Luke's message, it's an important part of Luke's message, but I don't think we can limit it to that. If we want to understand a word, there's several ways we can look at it. You can go to a, a dictionary, and if you, you can look at the definitions, the etymology, if you, if you look at the root words that are translated poor, uh, it carries the idea of humble, lowly, meek, or, or simply poor, as we would think of it. Uh, but the, 
the real meaning there is is really lowliness. If you look at the etymology or the root of that word, it's it's something that's low. It's it's uh, abased, and so that's behind this. Etymology or a dictionary, though, isn't always the best way to get the meaning of a word. <clears throat> um, my children, my grandchildren, didn't learn to talk by looking words up in a dictionary. They learned to talk by listening to a word used in context <clears throat> over and over. And especially when we want to understand words in scriptures, that's often a better source than um, looking it up in a dictionary or, or tracing its roots. If you look at the w way this word is used in the Old Testament, um, it's often used in Psalms. And typically the idea, let me read one example, Psalm 10, 12. But there's, there's many, you'll, you'll see this word all, all over in the, in the Psalms. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand, forget not the afflicted. It's the same word that's translated poor in Isaiah. So typically in the Psalms, the word poor is used in a plea to God for some kind of rescue or salvation. The poor are those who are unable, who have, in, in Psalms, you, you see the poor as being oppressed. They are, uh, have an oppressor that's too strong, that uh, if I'm poor, my oppressor is stronger than I am. I'm, I'm unable to save myself and I'm crying out to God for help. That's typically the context of the poor in the Psalms is someone who needs God's salvation because he's too weak or lowly or humble or, or because his oppressor is too strong for him and he can't save himself. If you look at how it's used in the prophets, again you see this idea of being oppressed by the powerful. Isaiah 10 um, Isaiah 10, 1 and 2, Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside from the needy, to, to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil and that they may make the fatherless their prey. So here the emphasis, as in many of the instances where this is used in the prophets, is that there is an oppressor, there is someone who is oppressed, the oppressed one is weak, the oppressor is strong, and, and again, if, if this oppressed one is to be saved from oppression, he has to cry out to God for salvation. The, the original picture, I don't know if this is original, but a, uh, for Israel, of course, this roots in the Exodus, where they're in slavery under a powerful oppressor. They are unable to do anything for themselves and they require salvation from a stronger, someone who is stronger than their oppressor who can come in and save them. So that's kind of the um, way this word is used and that's just what's behind the word poor when Isaiah comes to it and talks about uh, good news to the poor. So good news to the poor in historical context would be Moses coming to Israel in slavery and saying God is coming to rescue you. That's the idea of good news to the poor. In later context, of course, Israel has gone into captivity. They are um, dispersed and, and the prophets come and say God is going to come and bring you back to your land and establish his kingdom again. That's good news to the poor. Um, the idea of a remnant that's left, this remnant uh, that the prophets talk about is going to be weak. They're going to have oppressors. They're going to have people who hate them. They're going to cry out to God. That's the idea, the broader context of poor, not simply materially uh, without wealth, but but 
weak, lowly, humble, uh, persecuted, oppressed. That's, all of this is built into the idea of, of being poor. Um, I, the other way we can understand who the poor are is simply to look at this in the context and read the next phrases that, again, this is Hebrew poetry which has the tendency to say the same thing many different ways. And so if we look at how Isaiah is saying the same thing in the following verses, it'll give us some idea of, of uh, who the poor are. It says, to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. So the brokenhearted would be included in poor. Who are the brokenhearted? Uh, if you think of what that word implies, someone who's brokenhearted is someone who had hope and has lost that hope. I, I think that's probably the best way to summarize what we mean when we say brokenhearted. So, so someone with hope who has seen his hopes dashed. In, in, in Israel that would be, I saw my temple burned. You know, what's, what's left of my faith now? That's a loss of hope. That would be brokenhearted. Um, to proclaim liberty to the captives. So the captives are among what, the, the poor. And opening of prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. The mourners would be poor. Um, to grant to them, to grant to those who mourn in Zion the oil of gladness instead of mourning. So that also gives us a um, context for who the, who the poor is and what this means when he says good news to the poor. He says in verse 2, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Luke quotes the first half of that verse and, and ends the quote there. And um, Jeff touched on this, and I think it was in Sunday school a few weeks ago, and said that uh, the fact that he quotes the first half and leaves the other part out does not mean that he is intentionally excluding that as if I've come now to bring favor and vengeance is coming later. That's not the implication um, why Luke quits where he does, it may be an arbitrary, you know, he may have read much more than this. Uh, I agree with Jeff's assessment and I would emphasize that, again, this Hebrew poetry, when he says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, he's in fact saying the same thing two different ways. It sounds, it may sound to our ears like this is two different things. The favor and vengeance are opposites, but we should understand that in Scripture, um, especially in the Old Testament, um, vengeance and salvation or judgment and salvation are two sides of the same coin. They, they are so cl closely linked that, that um, to interpret Luke saying the first half of this and not the second as if there's something significant that he's only come to bring salvation now and the vengeance will be later. To interpret it that way would be like me saying, I'm, I want to give you a coin, but I'm only going to give you the head side this week and I'll give you the tail side next week. It, it just doesn't make sense. If you think about salvation in the Old Testament, when God saved Israel from Egypt, how did he do it? Did he bring, he, he could have brought a cloud down. He did for a moment. If you think about the Red Sea, there was this cloud that separated them from the Egyptians. Why, he, why didn't he bring that cloud down to begin with and say, there, scoot, go to, go to Palestine. I'll hide you from the Egyptians and that'll be the end of it. He didn't do that. He came and brought judgment on the Egyptians, and that was an integral part of their salvation. And if they missed that message in the plagues, he did it again. He brought them to the Red Sea, and what did he do? He brought the Israelites through on dry ground, and then that same water that, that was salvation for the Israelites was judgment on the Egyptians. And so our baptism, 
Is it salvation or judgment? Well, it's both. So, so when, when Isaiah says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, in fact, uh, the salvation and, and judgment are so closely linked in Scripture that I don't think we can even talk about separating those as if one comes now and the other will be a, another time. So when Isaiah qu or Luke quotes this, by quoting the first part of that verse, he, the, the implication is the, the whole is, is included. Um, so then the vengeance in Luke, even though it's not stated explicitly, it would be against sin and death or Satan or... Yes. <laughs> yes, it would be those things. Um, Luke talks about the winnowing, um, you know, again, referring to, I don't remember the passage, but I think that's in Isaiah, that the coming one would, would winnow the wicked. And so there is this idea of, of uh, separating the, the remnant from those who are to be judged. Um, all of, all of that would be included, all of that. Colby, would you care to comment on that? You're smarter than I am, and so. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, I'd, I'd have to think about that. Okay. Um, I wonder if there's a sense in which, um, whether it's intentional or not, the leaving that part out helps delineate Jesus as not the kind of Messiah that Israel was thinking he was going to be. As in, a, you know, a, a physical uh, savior and driving out Rome in that sense. Mm -hmm. so the vengeance piece, which they saw Egypt in, 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 with the Red Sea, you know, there was salvation for Israel in that, but the vengeance part wasn't maybe quite as true. I don't know. I'm, I'm just spitting yeah. on I, I I've, it. It might have helped. You, you know, we. Intentional in that regard. That's a good uh, suggestion. Um, it's almost like Jesus said this first part of the verse and the second part was so strongly implied without being stated that the, the, something the people heard made them very angry. When I read that passage in Luke, I scratch my head and say, what, what, why did they get so upset? What was it? You know, they started out adoring him and and by the end, they're very upset, and uh, it's almost like they see that, you, you know, some of my thoughts on that are um, when he says, I've come to bring good news to the poor, meaning poor, humble, lowly, oppressed. It's almost like they may be saying, what, you think that's us? You think that's we? That we're the oppressed, and and uh, I also wondered: is is leaving out this uh, vengeance? Is that almost an emphasis by omission? Since you know this passage and and you think it, I don't know. Uh, yeah, Rich. Rich. Um, a few weeks ago, Jeff was talking about kingdom language, where Isaiah was talking. He was using physical language, and Jeff said, "Well, it doesn't really sound so great to me." Um, because people seem to be dying and it didn't seem to be all that. But when we look at it spiritually, we see that they're using physical examples for, <clears throat> for spiritual things. So the poor, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And we look at the captives. Who are the captives? We're all captives of Satan mm -hmm. and Christ has set us free. Those who mourn, we're mourning our sins, we're mourning our, our condition, and Christ is setting us free from that. So I think when we look at it as kingdom language, representing spiritual things, we, we get the fuller picture of what Isaiah and ultimately Christ are talking about. Um. Debbie, to come back to your question, I, I, I have to say that when I look at how Scripture treats salvation and judgment, 
um, I, I don't have a full understanding of how they're linked, but I see that they very clearly are linked. Over and over you see them appearing again. And it's not simply that uh, God comes, you know, we can look at the Exodus and say, well, there's bad guys and good guys, and God judges the bad guys and saves the good guys. But there's more to it than that when we look at our salvation. Uh, in, when we look at baptism, for example, there's this idea that I am being judged and I'm being saved somehow at the same time. You know, that the, the death, uh, baptism is a death, and, and yet it's, it's life, and somehow they're linked in a way that I am un, inadequate to explain to you, and yet I see that it's there. Um, so, sorry, I can't give you a better answer than that. But. Um, okay, so that is Isaiah's prophecy that there would be one coming, anointed by God with the Spirit of the Lord, to bring good news to the poor. The, the, uh, it's sometimes translated to preach good news to the poor. It appears that way in the New Testament, but it's really bring good news to the poor. And, and in some ways, I think we have to see this as more than simply announcing good news. In some cases, we see it more as, well, what did Jesus do when he opened the eyes of the blind? He did not simply say, I have something good to tell you. He actually brought about the good news that was to come to the poor. So Isaiah uh, prophesies that there is one coming, anointed by God with the Spirit of the Lord to bring good news to the poor, and he explains that, that this includes the captives, the brokenhearted, um, those who mourn, and each of these is given a blessing appropriate to his, his specific condition. That then is what Jesus reads and says, this is why I'm here, this is what my ministry is going to be about. Um, and so, throughout Luke, we're going to see a special emphasis on the poor and all of that, all that that entails. Um, I want to look now at a specific passage, uh, the Magnificat, Luke 1, uh, 46 and following, and I want to read through this and see how uh, this fits with this theme. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed, to his offspring forever. Mary says all of this in response to the um, visit from Gabriel announcing um, that, or actually this is, um, this comes in at, at somewhat after her uh, visit from Gabriel, but it's, it is in fact in response. Gabriel has told her specifically Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. You have found favor with God. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son and call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give the throne of his father David to him. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So basically Gabriel has told her the kingdom of God is going to be restored as the prophets spoke through a, a son of David and this will come 
um, as your, this person will be your son. Um, so Mary, and I think when we read this, it's, it's helpful to think of Mary not just speaking for herself, but as a representative of the people of God. And um, So she is praising God for the salvation that is coming through her, but uh, not simply because God has blessed her, but because God has come to visit his people Israel again and is blessing the, the entire uh, people of God. Uh, <clears throat> she refers to God as her Savior. And I think it's... I'm going to, going to read a, um, something from a commentary on Luke that I think is helpful in understanding what Savior means. In praising God as her Savior, Mary stands in a long succession of those who have received divine aid. The term Savior does not here mean one who forgives sin so much as it means one who brings rescue. The Hebrew concept of salvation, while not always excluding the idea of needing forgiveness, is more about deliverance and it smacks more of the victories of the battlefield than verdicts of the courtroom. Yahweh gives Israel salvation in that he gives them victory in battle over their enemies, and a savior was first and foremost one who brought deliverance. Um, he quotes Isaiah or Obadiah 21, saviors will ascend Mount Zion, those who rescue and deliver Zion from the Edomites. In Christ, God has moved to save Israel from their foes, bringing down the sovereigns and oppressors from their thrones and exalting his lowly people. So I think that's helpful, and I think if you read the Old Testament and see how Savior and salvation are used in the Psalms and the prophets and, and the other passages in the Old Testament, you'll recognize what he's saying is basically right. That this is what... Um, Mary is saying in, in calling God her Savior. Uh, look at how Mary now talks about the poor. He has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Uh, humble would be one of the words that would be associated with being poor. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. Um, he talk, she talks about those of, in verse 52, those of humble estate, 53, the hungry. Uh, so all of these terms are associated with being poor and with God coming to bring aid to his, his people who are poor. Um, I, I, th I think properly understood here, poor is referring to the people of God in their condition basically still in exile, even though they've come back and are inhabiting their land, they're under um, other, um, they're under oppression. Mary recognizes here that even though they have their temple and they have their priests, they don't have a king. They are serving foreign governments and she recognizes properly that they are still in a state of exile and a state of oppression. So Mary is identifying with the people of God and saying, not simply I am poor, but we are poor, we are oppressed, we are uh, looking for a kingdom that has not yet come. I, I think it's helpful to reread the first few verses in first person um, pr plural rather than singular because I think Mary is really referring, speaking as a representative of God's people. My, our soul magnifies the Lord, our spirit rejoices in God our Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his people, his servants. From now on all generations will call us blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for us, and holy is his name. I, I think reading it that way emphasizes that Mary is not simply looking at what has happened and what she's been told as you know, I'm really special, God is doing great things for me, through me, but rather 
the emphasis is God has come to save his people. Yes, this announcement was made to me. Yes, it is coming through me, but it is more than a blessing to me. It is a blessing for God's people. Um, we're going to see a pattern here in what she's saying that, that is repeated throughout Luke, and that is this idea of the tables being turned. The the, there's two groups here. There's the poor, the oppressed, the people of God, and then there's the powerful, the oppressors. And what's going to happen as you read through here is that the poor are lifted up, the oppressors are brought low. Um, in verse 51, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. So uh, this idea that the powerful oppressors are being judged by God and, and brought low and, and the people of God who were low and, and under the oppression are being raised up. And that's going to be repeated. We'll see that in various places throughout Luke. It's an important theme to help us understand this idea of good news to the poor. One thing that struck me um, as I read through this passage, Jeff has repeatedly emphasized the idea that salvation is not an individual thing in the Bible that God is saving us as a community that we are all connected uh, that our, our salvation connects us to each other and, and God is saving not just individuals but a people but it's it, there's more than that if you read this his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation the Old Testament especially emphasizes not just <clears throat> a connection among community but a connection amongst from one generation to another so that we're not saved simply as individuals or even as the community of those with us now but we're saved together with those who came before and those who came after and, and um, Mary is recognizing that connection here when he, she talks about his mercy is from generation to generation. Hebrews talks about the fact that Abraham was given these promises and he didn't receive them except that we are blessed and those promises to Abraham are fulfilled in us. So our connection is not just among community but it's from generation to generation. Um, I think that's all I wanted to tell Any other comments about this passage or any anything else before we close here? It's 10.15. I just think, too, that her speaking, I mean, how many years have passed? Like 400 years. Um, mm -hmm. When we come to it, we see, oh, God's coming to save his people, but they've been waiting and waiting and longing and looking. And and I think, don't you think she feels that salvation is coming for the people and not just, oh, Jesus is coming. Yeah, it's coming for the people and it's, it's being fulfilled for those who have come before and who were waiting and it's being fulfilled for those who are coming after. And it's, it's, it's almost as if collectively all these generations are being blessed even though some have died without ever seeing the fulfillment of the promises, they are still, it's as if they're receiving those in us. Uh, right, and she had, I feel like she has that sense. And I wonder too when she's speaking, or when Jesus is speaking in the temple, do you think the people in the temple at that time had a sense of the history? Or do you think they were kind of thinking it's about them and all of a sudden the message they were wanting to hear to kind of exalt them was totally different coming from Jesus' mouth and they were shocked. I don't know. I, I think some and, and especially the 
poor that Jesus is talking to would have recognized you know you read the prophecies of um, uh, who, what was the name of the guy that was in the temple um, Simeon. Simeon you know he talks like uh, you know I, I've seen the Lord I can, I can die now he hasn't received any specific blessing but now that he's seen it, it's as if it's coming to my descendants or the, the rest of Israel that's coming after me. I'm satisfied that I've seen that fulfillment. And, and there's very much this idea that, you know, those who have come before have been waiting. Those who have come after will continue to receive the fulfillment and we're all connected together. We, we read, um, you know, the, the statements like, the mercy of the, of the Lord is from a thousand generations of those who keep His com commandments and, and how many generations it is of those who break will be under a curse. And we read those and we think, well, okay, so if this generation uh, commits sin and then the third generation turns, you know, which, which one applies? That's not how it's supposed to be taken. The point is that there's this connection from generation to generation and we're blessed or cursed you know, together as, as uh, not just a community, but an extended community through generations. So. Yeah. I, I think the thing that makes thinking about like the idea of the poor a little bit difficult is, well, and especially when <clears throat> you think about it, how it's used in the Gospels is because I, I was I was thinking about uh, what Jesus or uh, yeah, you know, what Jesus <coughs> said to the messengers of John the Baptist. Right? He said. Um, you know, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, which is the only kind of people who don't have their problem remedied. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, in other words, like, he doesn't give the poor money so that they can have a comfortable lifestyle now. Right, that isn't the remedy for the poor, whereas, well, you can't walk, okay, now you can walk again. And so I think that's, I think that's difficult. For yeah. us to think about what that means. Yeah. Yeah. We will talk about that specific passage, um, but we're getting kind of out of time, so let's close. And and uh, I will be out next week going to camp, and I think we're going to have our monthly prayer time then, and be back in two weeks. So.